right, welcome to the video on development. So first thing we're going to talk about is fertilization. Um, so in this process, when the lucky few sperm make it to the egg, um, they're going to penetrate these granulosa cells which come from the follicle. And then this blue layer is called the zona pellucida. And the acrosome in the sperm has enzymes that allow it to break through that zona pellucida. One sperm penetrates, and then there's actually an electrical change in the cell so that only one can get in. Um, if more than one got in, you would have the wrong number of chromosomes, and the cell wouldn't, couldn't divide properly, and it wouldn't develop. So the nucleus of the sperm is released, um, the tail falls off, and then the nucleus from the sperm and the nucleus from the egg are going to fuse together. So remember last time we talked about meiosis, how you ended up with cells with half the number of chromosomes. Here they fuse together and you have one cell with the correct number of chromosomes. And fertilization happens uh, in the fallopian tube usually. Hopefully implantation doesn't happen there, that's bad. Uh, we need to know how long pregnancy or gestation lasts. And it varies, but 266 days is the average, and that's divided into three trimesters, each three months long. All right, we need to know about in vitro fertilization. So if people are having trouble getting pregnant, they might do in vitro fertilization, where eggs are harvested from the ovary, and then they're mixed with semen in a dish. In vitro actually means in glass. Nowadays, it's probably a plastic dish, but we haven't changed the name. So they'll grow in a dish, and fertilization can actually happen in a dish if you give them the right nutrients, and you give them oxygen, and you keep them the right temperature. So these uh, embryos will grow in the incubator for a few days, around the 8 to 16 cell stage. They look at them, they pick the best ones, and insert them into the uterus, and hope they implant. And they'll usually um, pick more than one to improve the chances and that's why a lot of times with in vitro fertilization you end up with twins or um, triplets or even more. Um, the, the success rate for in vitro fertilization is only about 20 percent so not great but it is still an option. All right. So prenatal development can be divided into the pre-embryonic stage, which is the first 16 days, then the embryonic stage, which is the 16th day until the 8th week, and then the fetal stage beginning in the 8th week and lasting until birth. And we're going to look, we're going to watch a movie about the pre-embryonic stage. So there's kind of five stages on your study guide. So first you become a zygote, that's at fertilization. Um, then that's going to divide into blastomeres, that's the second step. And then it's going to become a morula, that's the third step. And then um, once it reaches the uterine it becomes a blastocyst and it has this cavity. 
that's the fourth thing and then implantation is the fifth thing so again fertilization forms a zygote with 46 chromosomes that's first then that's going to divide into what are called blastomeres um, if it's going to become identical twins, they would split at this point. Um, then third step is this cluster of 16 cells called a morula that is going to enter the uterine cavity. Um, inside the uterine cavity, it gets nourishment from glands in the endometrium that causes it to sort of rearrange into a blastocyst, which has a it's basically a hollow ball with the inner cell mass, which is going to actually become you. And then the outer part is going to form the placenta. And then around day six or seven, the blastocyst attaches to the endometrium, and that's implantation. All right, so this shows the um, implantation happening and the inner cell mass separating from the trophoblast to create the amniotic cavity. Um, it the inner cell mass flattens from what's called the embryonic disc, um, and then some cells are formed in the yolk sac. The embryonic disc gives rise to the germ layers, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, which is going to become all of your organs. So the fertilized egg is at which stage when it implants in the uterus? And the correct answer is a blastocyst. Alright, so next we need to know the function of HCG secreted by the trophoblast. So it prompts the corpus luteum to secrete estrogen and progesterone, which maintains the lining of the uterus. Um, so in the last class we talked about the ovarian and menstrual cycle, and when the progesterone levels drop and estrogen levels drop, um, that's what causes the lining of the uterus, the endometrium, to die and then slough off, and that's what causes menstruation. Um, you don't want that to happen when there's a, a baby implanted in it, otherwise that baby would die. So the trophoblast makes HCG, which then causes the corpus luteum to secrete estrogen and progesterone, which maintains that lining of the endome lining of the uterus, the endometrium, and so that it can nourish that baby. And HCG is what's detected by uh, pregnancy tests, the kind that you pee on. Older tests used uh, estrogen and progesterone. Those are, they're not as reliable because estrogen and progesterone levels seem to be fluctuating all the time. Um, but with HCG, you're very unlikely to get a false positive because that's only produced um, by the embryo or later on it's produced by the placenta. All right, next we're supposed to describe the embryonic stage. So this begins around 16 days and again goes till week 8. The important things going on is the germ layers differentiate into organs and organ systems. So all of your organs are formed, or at least started to form during this time. And then the extra embryonic membranes emerge. Um, we have the amnion, which is going to become the amniotic sac, which is filled with amniotic fluid, which is like a waterbed for the baby. It protects it, keeps it nice and warm in there. Uh, the chorion is the outermost membrane, and it is going to uh, help form the placenta. The allantois um, is going to develop into the umbilical cord, and then the yolk sac. Um, it actually produces your first blood cells. Um, it also provides nutrients and handles waste disposal um, until the placenta is formed. So this shows uh, the placenta and umbilical cord. And we need to know functions of the placenta. So the umbilical cord connects the baby to the placenta. The fetal waste moves from the umbilical arteries to the maternal veins, and then oxygen and nutrients and antibodies pass from maternal blood to fetal blood. So the, the blood is separate, but the maternal blood sort of pools in these spaces, and then um, again nutrients move from the mother to the baby, waste move from the baby to the mother. And the Fetal blood has hemoglobin similar to ours, but fetal hemoglobin 
uh, is much more strongly attracted to oxygen than regular hemoglobin, so it sort of steals the oxygen from the mother's blood. Very rude. Um, so the, the placenta um, delivers nutrients and gets rid of waste. It also secretes hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and HCG that are necessary for the continuation of the pregnancy. Next, we need to know the difference between dizygotic and monozygotic twins. So dizygotic or fraternal twins come from two eggs and two sperm. Um, so two separate eggs are released. They're released by two separate sperm, and they will form two separate placentas. Um, these commonly come from in vitro fertilization, then, or they can happen naturally. Monozygotic or identical twins come from one egg and one sperm, um, and so it forms a zygote, and then after that it divides. Uh, but they're sort of held together by the zona pellucida, so they usually form one placenta and they share it. Um, then next we need to describe the fetal stage of development. So around four weeks, the brain, spinal cord, and heart develop, and the GI tract begins to form. The heart begins to beat around day 22. Um, around eight weeks, now you're called a fetus. At this point, brain waves are detectable. The arms and legs are recognizable. Bone calcification or ossification begins, and the genitals are present. Uh, around 12 weeks, the face is well formed. It starts to look more human. The arms become longer and thinner. At this point, you can determine the gender. They swallow amniotic fluid, and their kidneys produce urine, and then they drink it again. But it's okay because it's very sterile in there because all their wastes go to the mother. Um, the eyes are developed at this point, but the eyelids are fused shut. Then around 20 weeks, lanugo, which is a fine hair, covers the body. The vernix covers the skin. This is like a waxy layer that's going to help it get through the birth canal. Uh, fetal movement can be felt at 20 weeks, and this is when fingernails and toenails appear. Um, and after that, it's pretty much just growing. More fat's deposited. They need to get big enough to be able to maintain their body temperature. By 36 weeks, the lanugo is mostly gone, and a baby born at 36 weeks is probably going to be just fine. Between 39 and 40 weeks is considered full term, and that's fetal development. Next, we need to know some physical changes that happen with pregnancy. So, to the digestive system, nausea and vomiting come in, comes from too much estrogen constipation and heartburn because as the uterus grows it pushes the digestive organs out of the way they don't have their normal space uh, it also increases the basal metabolic rate because um, the mother has to provide nutrients for this baby as well uh, with the circulatory system the mother's blood volume increases and cardiac output increases again so they can provide nutrients to the baby and also remove waste from the baby. This can cause some unfun things like hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and foot swelling. To the respiratory system, um, ventilation is going to increase again because they need to get oxygen for the baby. And again, as the abdomen as the uterus grows in the abdomen, it pushes organs up into the thoracic cavity and there's less room for the lungs, so that can lead to shortness of breath. Um, there can be nasal stuffiness due to the extra estrogen. Uh, to the urinary system, um, it can cause salt and water retention. It definitely will increase the urine output because you're getting rid of the baby's waste as well. And as the uterus, the uterus is located right on top of the bladder, so as it grows, it pushes on the bladder and leading to frequent urination, especially later in the pregnancy. With the integumentary system, uh, the abdomen and the breast can grow really rapidly, and this causes the skin to stretch and can leave stretch marks. The uterus enlarges really dramatically. Um, the areola darkens. There may be a line of pigment from the umbilicus down to the pubis. 
the skin on the face may darken or discolor. And then the uterus enlarges dramatically. It reaches the level of the xiphoid process, so that's the bottom of your sternum. It fills most of the abdominal cavity. It increases from 50 grams to 900 grams, so it increases 18 times, which is really amazing. So maternal cardiac output maternal cardiac output increases by 30% to 40% by the 27th week because and the answer is B as the uterus expands it demands a greater blood supply and that blood's also going to the baby all right the microbiome in pregnancy the vaginal microbiota changes the diversity declines lactobacillus increases and lactobacillus is actually the babies need that to help them digest milk it also becomes more acidic to protect against pathogens and any more sperm that would come in there you don't want to be pregnant again when there's already a pregnancy um, late in pregnancy it goes back to the non-pregnant state um, the oral microbiota becomes more densely populated and this may see the placental microbiota. There's a link between um, oral infections and complications in pregnancy. Uh, the gut microbiota changes late in pregnancy to promote weight gain. That's so the mother will be able to um, have enough nutrients for the baby, enough energy reserves for the baby, just in case. Uh, maternal stress during pregnancy is something you want to avoid. Chronic stress triggers cortisol release, and excessive cortisol impairs fetal brain development. This can cause things like ADHD and autism. It can result in infants who are anxious and fearful, and it appears to affect the child's motor development, coordination, and motor skills. Uh, childbirth is probably caused by a decline in progesterone, and the release of oxytocin and also the uterine stretching the the baby is pretty squished in there uh, and we need to know the stages so the first is dilation of the cervix the cervix is closed and then it opens up to about 10 centimeters to allow the baby to leave next stage is expulsion of the baby so the myometrium of the uterus contracts and pushes the baby out and then the last stage is delivery of the placenta. Uh, you need to get the entire placenta out, otherwise it can cause bleeding problems and that's not good for the mother. Uh, for lactation, uh, progesterone stimulates development of the acini, that's these green things that are making the milk, and estrogen stimulates the growth of the ducts, so that's why the breasts get bigger during pregnancy. And lactation is a positive feedback mechanism so when the baby's suckling that sends nerve impulses to the pituitary um, the pituitary then secretes prolactin which goes back to the breast and initiates milk production the pituitary also secretes oxytocin which forces milk into the ducts that's known as the letdown reflex so as the baby's suckling that's telling the body to produce more milk to feed the baby Uh, breastfeeding supports optimal growth and development, enhances development of immune and neurologic sy systems, it protects against the growth of harmful gut bacteria and helps establish a healthy microbiome, although formula is getting better and better and you'll probably establish the microbiome as you go through life. Alright, which hormone is responsible for the production of milk in the mammary glands? And correct answer is prolactin. 